it's a, an immense pleasure to be with you this Friday afternoon to talk about a very dear uh, topic to me, which is language awareness for language teachers. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking uh, Dizal for the invitation, for giving me the pleasure to, to share some of my experience with you all. I'd like to thank you all as well for being here. And I'd like to thank Faculdade de Cultura Inglesa for giving me the opportunity to be here with you. Let me start by sharing my sessions, uh, my presentation. Hi, hello. It's good to see you all. I can see, I can see some familiar names. That's nice. It's always good to be with teachers. So let me just share the presentation here. I hope you can all see uh, my first slide. So, so hi, hello everyone. Uh, this is the title of our talk today. It's language awareness for language teachers. Oops, there is a spelling here, but that's okay, teachers. And my name is Marilisa Shimazumi. Um, before I actually dig in into my presentation, I'd like to make a reference to an event we hosted last Friday, in which we had the pleasure of having uh, Teresa Sequia from Cambridge University talking to us about a series of um, uh, uh, talking about the Cambridge uh, English teaching framework. It is this documentation that she shared with us. Amazing, uh, amazing documentation. And in her description, hang on a minute. Oh, never mind. I will find it here. I had it opened. I wanted to share with you a valuable piece of information from this documentation and which talks to us about um, the, the topic we are going to work today, which is here, let me magnify it. What, uh, which talks mentions language and knowledge and awareness. So I'd like to start by um, defining with you and by quoting this uh, framework by Cambridge English Teaching. So the following areas of knowledge and competence presented together under the heading of language knowledge and awareness provide the linguistic basis on which teachers develop their personal understandings of teaching and learning and also play a critical role in how teachers make sense of and facilitating learning in the classroom. And this is, at the end of the day, what we are here for, to improve our professional knowledge and practice, and language awareness has all to do with that. So what does it mean to have a well-developed language awareness? It's the ability to analyze spoken and written language form, meaning, and use. So we have MPFU, and I keep telling my students, meaning, uh, pronunciation, form, and use uh, at sentence, word, and at discourse level, meaning, mark these words, discourse level, when planning, teaching, and marking your learner's work. Language awareness also refers to awareness to be able to analyze language, uh, the classroom language used by us teachers and used by our learners. Language awareness also means demonstrating the practical application of this ability and awareness for language learning and teaching when planning and uh, uh, our lessons and when executing our lessons in class. So we'll be talking about this ability, this skill, uh, well, I wouldn't say skill, this ability, this language awareness ability to analyze language from a multiple perspective, meaning pronunciation, form, and use. So 
let me share my the aims of my session here, which is to involve and invite you all, uh, participants, to reflect upon, uh, to reflect upon, to analyze, and to explain the use of the English language with a considerable good degree of confidence, and to revisit the need to develop explicit knowledge of and about the English language. A lot of what I'm going to, to talk to you here is what we do at the Faculdade Cultura Inglesa. And uh, I, I, I could see some of the names here popping up. I can see some of my students. So this is going to be quite a revision for you all. Uh, but before anything else, when we, have to, when we talk, when we address the issue of language and language teaching, we have to have it very clear what is our view of learning and our view of language. Um, from my perspective, I see uh, language as an opportunity, sorry, le learning here as an opportunity to expose our learners to language always in relevant, meaningful contexts, uh, obviously in safe and supporting environments, environment and learning should be seen as language work done through interaction and collaboration so students learners learning together so these are some of the, the principles behind what i consider learning now language what is language for us so for us at the faculdade we believe that language is Discourse, it's language in action. Language in action can only be seen as discourse. And language is also a tool for communication. And language happens in a non-linear way. There is no natural order, let's say. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit chaotic. Uh, how people communicate with one another, but that's why we have to approach the study of language as from a discourse perspective. Um, we don't consider, for example, language being only only a system of rules. For example, it is. It is also. It also involves learning the rules of the language, learning the grammar, the vocabulary, the lexis, but this all together as meaningful discourse. So this is where I come from, okay? And all the work I'm going to talk to you about language awareness has as fundamental principles, these two views of learning and language, because um, we cannot separate them. We, we, it's very hard to separate language from learning and also from teaching and obviously from culture in context, but this is important. They are inseparable entities. When we learn language, we learn much more than just the rules, right? So uh, when we talk about knowledges of language and becoming more aware, so let me uh, show here this diagram by Diane Larson Freeman and Marianne Celso Murcia, 2015, where both authors present this scheme of knowledge of and knowledge about language. So we know that to know a language, we have to know its form, okay? It's uh, the accuracy perspective, how the language is formed. We have also to know to master the meaning. So what does it mean, particular word or particular utterance? So we are looking from the perspective of meaningfulness, but we cannot forget its use. So language in use, when do we use a particular utterance or a particular word? Why do we use it? So we have several golden questions there. When we use it, why, who we use it to or with, um, so with whom, uh, when, oh, it's there, where. So several keywords and how we use it. So this has to do with this dimension. 
So meaning, form, and news. So knowing of the knowledge of language is knowing about the language system. But knowing about the language, we are talking about a bigger dimension, a broader dimension, language as a piece of discourse. So if I show you this example here, a teacher is a hardworking professional. We all know. We all are. And then continuation here. He even works on weekends. And I am calling your attention, drawing your attention to the use dimension here. It is, well, if we see it, it's in terms of its accuracy, it's quite an okay, quite accurate sentence. Uh, we can follow its meaning because it's in um, because of if of its syntax, the form. We have a subject verb and a complement here, not an object but a complement. And here we have a subject verb, and the verb is intransitive. He works on weekends. We we can understand it logically, mm -hmm. but I'm calling your attention to the use perspective. There is something here which our context nowadays um, ask us, asks us to reconsider how can we make it more relevant to our days. So we all know uh, of, of uh, the language use and how we have to be very careful in our choices. He here, the pronoun he, is not wrong. Can somebody write on the chat, why am I calling your attention to the use? We can understand the form, we can understand the meaning. There is a bit of an issue with the use dimension. And it has to do with he, the pronoun, the personal pronoun he. Anybody would like to try? Okay. So, why not a she? Great, Luciana. That's it. Why not a she? But then uh, it, it would be a bit clumsy if I said he's a, a teacher, is a hardworking professional. He, she, we, that's it, Tamili. That's it. Uh, they even work on weekends. So, one of the, that's it, one of the first um, red flag here for us nowadays is how we we call each other how we prefer to be called and we have to be as inclusive as possible and why when we think about the teacher as a profession we come with the pronoun he it's not grammatically incorrect it's meaning it's understandable however it's use it's a bit questionable exactly with gustavo so we have to be more aware of the gender choices we have to use. So they would be the more appropriate for our use. Obviously, it will definitely depend on the context. I'm, I'm generalizing, but this is, this is something, an aspect that we should consider. So a teacher is a hardworking professional. They even work on weekends and holidays. Okay, so this was just a warm up. Uh, I'd like to, to quote here. Uh, Professor Kanavilio Rajagopalan. This was an oral communication, and uh, where he says he said that um, second language learners seek, seek communicative abilities that empower them to do things with language, encompassing, so involving discourse and rhetorical skills rather than purely linguistic skills. So by this quote, Professor Raja Gopalan is also, um, well, I'm using Raja, Professor Raja Gopalan to reinforce our view that there is much more to language than just the form, the accurate, the rules of the language. Uh, learners, L2 learners, Second language learners want to, they seek communicative abilities, communicative competence, which does not only involve the linguistic competence, the grammatical competence. It involves discourse, strategic and pragmatic knowledge of the language. 
Yeah, okay, so here we are. Uh, so therefore, I am uh, advocating for a language awareness perspective, which should be based on a discourse perspective. And here my students from the faculty will be, I hope you can remember this good old Guy Cooks, 1989, uh, uh, let's say, a taxonomy, in which he advocates for an approach to language from a discourse perspective. Uh, let's, let's, let's try and analyze Guy Cook's perspective here. So when we are doing all those uh, lists of language awareness definitions by the Cambridge framework, we should be able to analyze the spoken and written form, uh, meaning, use from both perspectives. So form is here, okay? The bottom-up approach, we approach language, we approach discourse by analyzing its um, systems, grammar, lexis, even pronunciation, if it's oral, comprehension, discourse level comes here from a top-down perspective, so who we are, who we are talking to, where we are, when is the interaction taking place. So all this, they play a fundamental part in our feedback to our learners. So before we say something is right or wrong, which there isn't, uh, there isn't such a thing as right and wrong, what is there is appropriate or inappropriate according to the context. So we should take into account this, um, I would say this framework by Guy Cook. So analyzing our students' language production from a bottom-up perspective and also from a top-down perspective. How do we do that? So in our session today, I want to, to give you uh, two suggestions on, on how you can approach language from this perspective and perhaps um, consolidate our language awareness. So I'm going to show you this a piece, a short uh, YouTube snippet and I would like you to watch, take notes of what you can get from the speakers actually from the speaker here, okay, uh, Miss South Carolina. So hang on a minute, please. Okay, the viewing task, just take notes of what Miss South Carolina has to say, please. Recent polls have shown a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a world map. Why do you think this is? I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some people out there in our nation don't have maps, and uh, I believe that our ed education, like such as in South Africa and uh, the Iraq, everywhere like such as, and. I believe that they should, uh, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S. Um, or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries. So we will be able to build up our future for our children. Thank you very much, South Carolina. Okay. So you had a short snippet. Let me go back to our session here. And if you weren't able to get everything, don't worry. This is, this is the, the transcript. So we had one member of the jury asking her, recent polls have shown that one fifth of Americans can't locate the US on a map. Why do you think this is? So Miss South Carolina started by saying, I personally believe that us Americans are unable to do so because some people out there in our nation don't have maps and I believe that our education, like um, such as in South Africa and the Iraq, 
everywhere, like such as, and I believe that they should, um, our education over here in the US should help the US or should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries. So we will be able to build our future. So, teachers, what would we do if we had Miss South Carolina in our rooms, in our classrooms, and how can we better help her? We can see that not everything can be trashed or banned here. We can see that Miss South Carolina has some intention that perhaps she hasn't been able to convey her thoughts in a more, let's say, cohesive or coherent way. Yes, Marina said, I believe she didn't understand the question because um, she was, yeah, of course, the nerves are playing quite a lot there. And Vanessa, teach her to build her opinion by making a list of ideas, organize them according to their importance. Ah, okay, so together with Vanessa's um, uh, uh, contribution here. Let's say, how can we teach her to start prioritizing pieces of information? Uh, and there is the conclusion missing, obviously. So I said that I'm going to share with you two perspectives, and these perspectives, they have to do with Guy Cook's perspective. How can we better help assist our learners from a bottom-up perspective and a top-down perspective and make sure they are able to do the three dimensions. They are able to be clear in their speech from a discourse perspective in terms of accuracy, uh, meaning, and use, appropriacy. So we have accuracy, meaning, meaningfulness, and appropriacy. So, um, I'm quoting here Halliday Hassan, uh, Rukaya Hassan, 1989, and um, uh, these authors, grammarians, they help us look at language from a bottom-up perspective, from the system. And this we are quite good at. We know uh, the rules of the language, so we are quite familiar. But how can we help our learners make their texts hang together. Great, Tiago. Yeah. So, according to Halliday and Hassan, we have some cohesive devices. One of them is from a grammatical uh, cohesion. We can ensure our learners are cohesive from a grammatical perspective. How come? By teaching our learners to work with the system of references more clearly, uh, make them aware that they can use substitution, ellipsis, or the, the most, I think, the most common and popular grammatical cohesive device, which, is, which are the markers, the linkers. I think everybody knows about linkers. So, but, and, or, therefore, however, we tend to, to teach our learners quite a lot on, and there is quite a lot of practice in our course books on the markers, discourse markers. And um, my proposal here is for us to work on the other spheres, uh, for example, reference and substitution, as well as conjunctions, markers, linkers. There is also, I won't be able to deal with that, but I'm just showing you, teasing you, that there is the, what we call lexical cohesion, which also helps our Miss Carolina uh, be clear and uh, develop her discourse in a more coherent, cohesive manner. So we have lexical chains and repetition of the topic. I think lexis has to do with the theme, the topic, and from a rhetorical perspective, parallelism, is also another, let's say, technique or device. So let's go back to approaching then ling the language from a micro, 
discourse perspective, micro is the bottom up. Uh, here we have the same speech by our Miss South, South Carolina. And sorry if, if uh, the colors for some people, it's, you, you cannot see much of a difference. We have here uh, a green color, but I put in um, uh, without uh, not being bold or underlined. So we have these cohesive devices here. We have referencing, okay, substitution, and the use of linkers. So we are what we call text text attack. We are attacking a text from a micro discourse perspective from the system. So what do we mean by referencing? Our Miss South Carolina, she was quite able to use referencing. And here, uh, I personally believe that us, us, who are us, as Americans, so referring to the Americans in the question. So it's an anaphoric reference, are unable to do so. Are unable to do so. This is quite a sophisticated level of substitution. Instead of repeating everything, instead of saying, I personally believe that as Americans are unable to locate the US on a map, she was sophisticated enough from a micro perspective to use a substitute, right? So, and she also substitute the US by our nation. So her Lexis repertoire is good. That's great for, for her. And she's able to show that she is um, versed in some of the markers. We have end and end, such as, as giving an example, such as in, in South Africa, obviously, obviously she has a bit of a language vice and she keeps on using such as, such as, and she gets lost. But this such as for exemplification is wonderful, it's great. So conjunction for consequence, so, or as a result, we will be better able to build our future. We will be able to build uh, our future. What we have here, um, so far, we have been able to show that our Miss South Carolina has been able to use uh, some of these um, devices, cohesive devices that help making texts hang together. But it, it was still, even so, it was very hard to follow her. So referencing, she was able to make use of the referencing system. So when we talk about referencing, we are talking about uh, deitic uh, devices in pronouns, pronouns, personal pronouns, uh, demonstrative pronouns. So uh, when she substitutes here, us, the personal pronoun us is substituting Americans. So um, when we refer to something that is not in the text, we refer to in, um, sorry, exophoric referencing, which is outside the text, exo. But when we have references in the text, we call it endo, inside the text, within the text, and there are two um, movements. We can refer to something that has been mentioned before, what we call anaphoric, or something that will be mentioned later, which is quite sophisticated, but she didn't use that, which is the uh, cataphoric referencing. Okay, I don't want you to get too bogged down into the terminology here. How, how can we help our learners? Um, you can scan the QR code here, but I am also bringing you it's this handout here, okay? So let me know if you have been able to scan before I place it in front of you. If you haven't, you can 
take a, a, a print screen from from this text. This is the, the size of the text, okay? I have extracted this text from the Folha de São Paulo, the English version. Oh, good, good, Luis, you, you have been able to scan. So it, it was an article from Folha de São Paulo published very recently, this week, October the 13th, 2022, and um, whose title is Microdoses of Mushroom Against Anxiety Become Trend in Brazil. Products are used in retreats and sold by online stores despite their risks. Okay, so the exercise, we are not going to do everything, but um, this is just a hint to how you could possibly work with your learners on the cohesion from the bottom bottom-up perspective, the micro level of this course, and helps make a text hang together. So here, I, I've uh, typed it again, and I have included some numbers on the deitic pronouns, on the pronouns that refer to something, something outside the text or something inside the text. And um, it took me some time to find a very appropriate text because here, this is this is wonderful. This very first um, line here, the two first lines, they are wonderful because they help us fill in the, uh, this types here. For example, let's read it the first time here, the first lines, um, the line. It's from Natal. At the height of the pandemic, so short of breath, he, he thought it was COVID. Davi, 24, bought a handful of mushrooms online, crushed them, and ate them straight. Let's just stop here. So at the, at the height of the pandemic, the pandemic, what kind of pandemic? What sort of, what, what pandemic are they talking about? Is it here in the text? Not actually, right? Uh, so the here is an article, definite article, that assumes we know what we are talking about. But it refers to the 2021 20, global COVID pandemic. And the reference is outside the text. It's exophoric. So again, it assumes that the readers know what has been talked about. Can you help me now? Can you write it on the chat? What does number two, he, refer to? Uh, then. And number four, then again. So that we can, we stop here. We are going just Davi. Okay, so he here should, should refer to Davi. Absolutely. Let me see. Yeah, let me see if I can write. Yes. So he, Davi. Uh, he thought it was COVID. David, 24, um, bought a handful of uh, mushrooms and crashed then. What does then refer to? Mushrooms. Perfect. This is it. And crashed for number three and number four, we are talking about the mushrooms and they are there right in the text. Now, I want you to point me to the directions. Look at how sophisticated this these lines are so so short of breath he thought it was covid he thought who is the he so far here in the beginning at the height of the pandemic so short of breath he thought it was covid davi 24 bought so davi hadn't been introduced before before the pronoun so in this case, what kind of referencing are we talking about here? Is it anaphoric or cataphoric? In other words, is the, where is my, hang on a minute, let me get my, uh, okay, here. Um, Davi, Davi is before or after he? 
metaphoric wonderful. So Davi is a very uh, interesting referencing item. It is cataphoric. And it creates, it's a, if you see, if you analyze it very carefully, it's a very sophisticated use of referencing. It's usually found in murder mysteries, in thrillers, when we want to cause, when we want to tease uh, our readers. But then mushrooms here, they bought, he bought a handful of mushrooms, crushed then at then straight. So mushrooms, in both cases, it is anaphoric because we knew exactly what was talked about so in this very first line you could tell your learners work with our, your learners of course you don't necessarily have to use these terms exophoric uh, cataphoric anaphoric right these are uh, endophoric inside the text and the other is outside the reference is only will only make sense to people who have gone through the pandemic. But since it's a global, uh, it has been a global pandemic, uh, I think quite a lot of people will know um, what to uh, what what it refers to. So uh, he here is a reference to something that has been mentioned only after the, the pronoun. Okay, let me go back. So it is here for you. It's a handout. You will be able to have it later after it, the session finishes. It will be made available to you, but it's very easy for you to find it on the internet. Just Google Folha de São Paulo English. And it's a very... Um, updated text so it's still there um, right we have talked about here let me go back to guy cook's taxonomy we have talked about cohesion and cohesion is right here as you can see how to make the texts or element of text is hang together and um, and we have worked with the referencing system now um, I would like to work with you with coherence which is making texts make sense so my question to you would be, when we listen to our Miss Carolina, South Carolina, could we follow what she was saying? Uh, I went through some of your um, comments here. Oh, my God, by Vanessa, Louise. Oh, my God. Uh, Janaki said, I felt her a little lost when answering. Yes. Oh, my God. And gee, yes, she was nervous. Yeah. Because she was nervous, I don't think she could actually articulate her thoughts very well. So, our, the articulation of our thoughts in a logical manner has to do with coherence. So, I always tell my students, what's the difference between cohesion and coherence? Cohesion is in the text. They are marks, devices that you find in the text. They are there traits now coherence it's, it's something broader it's in the readers in the listeners mind it has to do with context it has to do with culture it has to make sense to the public to the context where it's being said so those questions who where when how to whom right who is saying to whom so these play a very important part in making sense of our words of our discourse and um, one way of saying that of working with coherence is by working with theme and ream again i am quoting uh, the work of michael holiday and it has been uh, uh, adopted by different uh, uh, 
uh, grammarians as well here in Brazil. So it's not going to be very difficult for you to find literature on theme and rim. And in Portuguese, we call it tema rema. Okay? So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of play. Right? So how, how can we help Miss South Carolina organize her text in a way that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Later on, I will go back to here, uh, to what you, you have been writing. Um, this is a text. I particularly uh, like using it because it has to do with uh, our reality. Sometimes it's very hard to find texts, uh, authentic texts, that um, talk about teachers. And even it's in Portuguese. So you are going to spare me here. Uh, I, it, it's 2018, before the pandemia, but it talks about the base nacional docente, vejo que muda na formação. So you, you have a very, it's a long text, but I decided to collect, to analyze this part here. So, a base nacional docente não substituirá as atuais diretrizes curriculares nacionais de formação inicial e continuada da educação básica. A base docente orientará a atualização dessas diretrizes. Ela também não contempla os conteúdos que os cursos de pedagogia ou licenciatura irão abarcar. O que fica no escopo da proposta do MEC são as competências que os futuros professores vão desenvolver para estar em sala de aula. Desta forma, o documento orienta as mudanças curriculares sem ferir a autonomia das universidades. I chose this text in particular because here, oops, not this one, what is it here? In the handout. This is the text, right? It is from a discourse perspective, from the top down, very well written. Why? Can somebody help me? Why? From a coherence perspective, and especially from what we have mentioned before here, tema e rema, theme and rim. This is a very coherent text, and that perhaps Miss South Carolina could, could have used these devices. Any, any idea for theme and rim? Let me just show here my analysis of this part of the text that could be our student's text. So if, what, what did I do? I just typed each sentence. By sentence, I mean starting uh, by a capital uh, letter, which, which signals it's the beginning of a clause, up until a full stop here. So next, up until a full stop, okay? So... Okay, great, Tiago. I'm not talking about transitivity, okay? The participants and the processes, but here uh, it's the theme and rim, but um, that's great. Great to know that you are familiar with systemic functional linguistics by Holiday. That, that helps a lot. So the texts, exactly, Andrea, they have the same subject. Now, in systemic functional linguistics, talking, mentioning what Tiago said, Instead of using the word subject and verb, we use theme, okay? The theme of each clause is the same, it's the same theme. So it's the base nacional. So the base nacional, a base, ela, ela what? The base, o que fica no escopo da proposta, so here, desta forma, o documento, so look how interesting it is, uh, there is substitution, remember the lexical, so we substitute base docente for an anaphoric referencing, 
right? Ela, it. And we use substitution, instead of using base, we use proposta, do Mac. And instead of using base, proposta, we use documento. So uh, the writer here is showing that he or she, they have a considerable repertoire to avoid repeating the same word, base nacional, all the time, docente, but still keeping the same theme, keeping the same topic, which makes our understanding much easier. So me as a reader, I as a reader, I can follow this topic, this text. So this is then here. This is what we have just, just analyzed. The theme is constant. It's the same. It's, it's yeah, exactly. So uh, thank you, Anna. Yes, that was a good example. And even contextually speaking, because it's about teachers uh, and our careers. Now, according to Halliday, we can have four thematic progressions. You don't have to worry about, I, I'm just going to present them to you and to tell you that some of them are very common in encyclopedias. If you go to, uh, if your students consult Google and Wikipedia, some of them are quite uh, common the way the texts are organized, and they are organized on purpose to be able to be understood. So here we have what we call a constant theme pattern, just like the um, base nacional docente that you, you, you saw. So what is an operating system? So RIM, theme and RIM here, the theme. An operating system runs a computer. It controls how the parts of a computer interact and organizes information in and out of the computer. Without an operating system, a computer cannot be used effectively. Some operating systems are DOS, CPM, OS2, and Unix. Uh-huh, okay. So, so uh, thank you, Thiago. So this is one possible thematic progression that you could teach your learners to improve their writing skills by using obviously some uh, pronouns to substitute, change for synonyms. So this is the constant, you keep the same. Obviously, we don't work like that, we don't talk like that all the time. Sometimes we talk in zigzags. So what, what does it mean? So this is a text that was taken from, I think, a biology textbook from Australia, where Professor Hassan used to work. Now um, she's deceased, unfortunately. But here, the linear theme pattern. It's linear, but it's zigzag. OK? It's a bit a bit old, but like, like this. The stomach produces gastric juice, which, which is the gastric juice, contains dilute hydrochloric acid. The acid kills most of the bacteria in the food. The partly digested food passes next, to, to, next into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. This, this duodenum is a coiled tube about eight meters long, which is as wide as a man's thumb. Okay, I hope you, you could get the visual zigzag, which uh, Halliday calls it a linear theme pattern. Um, I know. Um, our time is almost finishing. I want you to, to go through the two next uh, progressive uh, uh, phonetic progression, which is the split rim, when what comes after the theme gets divided, which is very common. We talk about it very, uh, we use this 
a strategy very much so. So the, let me read it for you. The only other considerable region of dense population in the world lies in Japan. So here we have the linear pattern. Japan, this country, and look, this country, anaphoric referencing. This country shows a remarkable fusion of both densely populated rural and urban communities. So we have rural communities and urban communities. These, uh, sorry, Japanese farmers, so related to the rural communities, practice a typical monsoon Asian subs subsistence economy. Whereas millions of people living in vast industrial cities such as Tokyo and Osaka, which are here, the urban communities, have much in common with the counterparts in Europe and North, North America. So this is a very sophisticated way of writing, where you split the rim into new themes. Very logical, because we expect when he presents the rural community and the urban community, for us to hear a bit more about it. Last of all, don't, don't be put off by the taxonomy, the names, okay? We just, we have only these four patterns. And I like this very much. It's when you present something in the theme. So in here, I'm going to talk about rat-like rodents. Include hamsters, lemmings, voles, and gerbils, as well as rats and mice. What happens here? The black rat is found in buildings, sewers, and rubbish yards. But it, the black rat, has been largely replaced by bigger, more aggressive brown rat. Voles are mouse-like rodents that live in the grasslands of Europe and Asia. Water voles or water rats build complex tunnels along riverbanks. The house mouse lives inside buildings and it's a serious pest because it, the house mouse, eats stored food. The field mouse comes near human dwellings. So what we have here, we have rat-like rodents. Uh, some of them are here. So you could say, well, they come from the theme. Yes, but uh, the, um, the overarching structure are rodent-like, uh, are rat-like rodents, okay? It's what the very first line signaled. And the author goes on describing them to us. So in here we have different ways of working with theme and dream patterns. I have planned Socrative activity, but it's okay. We can do it together without you going to the Socrative. Uh, this exercise was extracted from Scott Thornbury uh, in his book, Sent Beyond the Sentence. I really like working with this text and it's this one. You can take a print screen or you have the QR code here. Help me. You can, you can write on the chat, A or B. You can do this with your learners to make them more aware how to write coherently, how to activate referencing, uh, context, uh, background knowledge. It's not the micro level, but it's the macro level. So have a look and you will get the hang of it. Uh, we are talking about ancient Egyptians and um, pyramids. So here the ancient Egyptians buried the pharaohs in tombs called pyramids. What would be the continuation? In Giza, Ginza near Cairo are the most famous pyramids or the most famous pyramids are in Ginza, uh, near Cairo. The ancient Egyptians buried the pharaohs in tombs called pyramids. Yes, 
the pyramids, uh, sorry, yes, letter B, the most famous pyramids are in Ginza. Yes, that's it. Uh, let me get a highlighter here. Can I? Yes. So, yes, absolutely. Continue. Some pyramids are made of uh, more than 2 million blocks of stones, of stone. They were dragged into places by a team of workers. Team of workers dragged them into place, A or B. Some pyramids are made of more than 2 million blocks of stone. Great, absolutely. They were dragged. They, what they? Anaphoric referencing. They, the stones, the blocks of stones were dragged into place by teams of workers. The pyramids were built to house the body of the pharaoh. Inside each pyramid is a secret chamber. A secret chamber is inside each pyramid, A or B. Starting now, now I don't know anymore, but I, I assume, yeah, we are okay. We are, yeah, A. That's it, because we are talking about pyramids here. This is the tomb where the mummy of the pharaoh, pharaoh was laid. Robbers have stolen most of these mummies, or most mummies have been stolen by, 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 by robbers. This is the tomb where the mummy of the pharaoh was laid. That's it. Most of the mummies have been stolen by robbers. So you got the hang of it. And you were only able to get the hang of it because of thematic progression. I'm not telling it's zigzag, but because of the theme. How we, as readers, we expect the text to unfold, to develop. So this is what our learners should be um, more capable of. Ah, it is here. Or of um, uh, developing. So, uh, it's... We have three minutes to go. Oof, good. Um, if you were able to scan, you are scanning um, the handout of the session, the slides. And I, I would ask uh, Lyrica if you could do me a favor and put it on the uh, uh, on our chat, the PDF. So, so yeah, thank you very much. Here goes uh, for those who have been unable to scan uh, my slides. Here they are. Okay. Um, I am open for yes. Sorry for two minutes of questions. And but here goes the references as well for the works I have referred to. Okay, so let me go back. I don't know which which slide you prefer for me to leave it on. Um, but I'd like to thank you. Thank once again, Dizal, for this opportunity. Yes, Sylvania, uh, you are using mobile. Have you been able to use it to, to scan everything? Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Thank you, my students, for, for being here as well. It's always great to have to have seen, to, to, to know and to see you here. And thanks for participants who I didn't know and um, very nice working with you. If you want, come to the Faculdade and um, pay us a visit. Thank you very much. We have one minute if you want to ask a question. That's okay. I don't know whether the presentation will finish automatically. Thank you. I, I don't know when will be the next class. Um, thanks, Ana, Ana Carolina. Um, Eurico, I don't know. I think you have to check the Dizal events. Thanks, Vanya. Samantha. Question. Let me model question. Ah, uh, maybe they are ah, now I'm looking at the okay. 
Yeah, no questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys.